So uh, thanks for the, while well, we're getting set up here, thanks for the organizers uh, for inviting me to give a talk. Um, sort of in the, in the spirit of, uh, of, of the meeting, what Enzo talked about, and what Enzo talked about uh, yesterday, um, this, this, uh, this work is a collaboration of uh, a, a big group of people. Tsuyoshi has a, has a program at Los Alamos uh, to, to work in this area, and he sort of rallied a variety of people around material scientists, uh, superconductivity people, um, uh, accelerator people to, 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 to move this project forward. Um, I'm actually new to this area, um, I'm, a, I'm a, su a surface chemist, and I do a lot of material science things, uh, but somehow I think this runs in the family because I'm the nephew of Hartwig Kaiser, who some of you may know. Um, I think he's retired, from da he's retired from Daisy now, but uh, he, at the end of his career, I believe he worked in this area for, for some time. Um, all right, as I said, there's a collaboration of a variety of people, and actually there's one missing off of this cover slide, and that's uh, Kagoshima University who uh, have started also to make multi-layers uh, for us to look at. Which one of these? Okay. So, um, uh, so, so Claire sort of set the stage for a lot of the things I'm going to talk about, and I'm going to cover a little bit of the same ground here. The fir these first two slides sort of uh, talk about, you know, why we should be interested in, in doing ultra-thin films and doing them as multi-layers. Um, and again, it comes back to the uh, the idea of, uh, of Alex Gurevich uh, from a few years ago uh, talking about how if you have a thin film that's uh, thinner than the uh, penetration depth, then you can enhance the uh, HC1, which I think people are now talking about as sort of a figure of merit for, uh, for performance in, in these materials. Uh, so the... Uh, Which one of these is the, does this thing work or? Oh, that's it. Okay. Um, so again, as, as, as I mentioned, sort of the key idea is using a uh, thin superconductor uh, so that we can uh, uh, make the superconductor thickness less than the penetration depth or close to the penetration depth than less, uh, and in that way enhancing HC1. So the, in, in fact, the, the critical magnetic field that we're concerned with uh, uh, where you would obviously see quench is somewhere between HC1 and HC2, and if we can't get at that directly, at the very least, as sort of Claire pointed out, a uh, figure of merit, if we stay below that, a figure of merit is HC1. That allows us to stay below the HRF. Um, uh, in this particular calculation, this is for MGB2. Uh, uh, these are the values that were used in the calculation, uh, 5 nanometer coherence length. Uh, penetration depth of 140 uh, nanometers. You see that as the film thickness gets lower, the the critical field HC1 goes goes way up. And Tsuyoshi will talk about this slide and the next one in much more detail. So so why should we why should we be concerned about material science in these um, uh, in these systems? And actually, Charlie Charlie Reese yesterday sort of pointed out it's it's all material science now. People understand, well, at some level, the, the physics is, is better understood, but now we have to overcome the material science issues associated with putting down uh, thin films, putting down nice, uh, good, good material, and then going even further than that and putting down multi-layers that have good interfaces there, where there isn't intermixing and, and, uh, uh, and compromised chemistry, perhaps. Um, so, the, so the issues are, as, and Claire sort of talked about this as well, of course, uh, is that we use these multi-layer systems of a superconductor and a dielectric material uh, on top of niobium um, so, so that we always stay below the critical field of, of niobium. And this is obviously one layer shown, and she showed a diagram of, of, of several layers and, and how that would be applied. Now, again, I'll, I'll come back to why, should, why we should we care about the material science of these of these things. Well, it's it's important because uh, the film thicknesses um, the film thicknesses are are going to be relatively critical in in optimizing the performance of these systems. Film thicknesses, and then obviously chemistry. So, 
Uh, so we have to try to address the material science issues of that. So what I'm going to be talking about um, uh, in this talk is uh, several different systems, niobium nitride and MGB2, uh, ultra-thin films and also multi-layers, uh, that are put down by a couple different methods. So the first, uh, uh, the first one uh, I'll, I'll talk about is niobium nitride, and that's uh, nit uh, niobium nitride that's been put down by a pad po process, and I'll talk about that in a, in a little bit. It's polymer cested deposition. Second one I'll talk about is, uh, is uh, MGB2 uh, done by uh, MGP2 done by uh, Superconductive Technologies uh, Incorporated, Brian Mulkley. Uh, and the multi-layers associated with that, the dielectric layers, are atomic layer deposition done by Thomas Proly at Argonne National Laboratory. Uh, then we also have samples of uh, multi-layers uh, of MGB2 with uh, boron dielectric inner layers done by Kagoshima University. So I'll talk about uh, I'll talk about sort of those four, uh, four materials. And then in the future, uh, we're going to be also trying to do some CVD and plasma enhanced CVD of these, uh, of these two systems uh, at Los Alamos. Um, so there's a variety of characterization tools in this, uh, in this collaboration. And I will really uh, be talking about these first ones, um, X-ray diffraction, SEM, scanning probe microscopy, XPS, uh, an OJ uh, sputter depth profiling, and I'll spend most of the time on and looking at the uh, the thin film morphologies uh, with the XPS and the and the sputter depth profiling. Uh, for the superconducting and magnetic characterization, Tsuyoshi will talk about that. Um, I guess in the afternoon here. Um, so w one reason that I think this collaboration is working very well is that the the materials and thin film char characterization are carried out in concert with the deposition methods and also the, uh, uh, the superconducting and magnetic properties characterization of these materials. Um, and that allows us to sort of be agile in terms of adjusting uh, parameters and, uh, and deposition methods and deposition thicknesses and things like that, depending on what we find out from the, uh, from the physical properties characterization. So the issues that we need to be concerned with based on the work we've done here is the chemistry and phase at the interfaces and surfaces, and I'll, I'll talk about all these things here, interface mixing and then also uh, film thickness and how that affects the, uh, the properties of the material. So film synthesis methods, um, uh, the one missing here is Kagoshima University, uh, and, and also I, uh, the, I don't have a description here of the atomic layer deposition, but I'm sure Thomas will can can enlighten anybody that, uh, that is interested. Uh, so first of all, the polymer cested deposition. This is essentially a solid gel method, and currently we've been doing this only on planar substrates, but the idea was that you might actually be ad able to adapt this to conformal coatings on the, you know, uh, on the interior surfaces of, of RF cavities. So the way this works, pad solution in this particular case is uh, the niobium, uh, the niobium precursor is niobium chloride, and then there's a variety of, of other things in the solution. The, the polyethylene imine obviously gives it uh, gives the, the solution the viscosity to be able to coat surfaces in, in thin ways. Currently on the planar substrates, we're spin coating. Uh, uh, and then there needs to be obviously a post anneal to convert this niobium chloride into niobium nitride. And the anneals uh, currently for us has worked that has worked well is close to 1,000 degrees C. There's some variation, and we're still at some level refining the, the details of this anneal. And uh, the nitrogen source is ammonia to produce niobium nitride, and then methane if you want to produce niobium carbide. Um, and we originally did some niobium carbide work, but that was sort of less fruitful, and we, uh, we eventually uh, have been mostly pursuing uh, niobium nitride. Now this pad process, has been shown to actually produce very uh, nice niobium nitride. Uh, this is the particular reference for that. Uh, but the pad process was actually developed for other materials. In, in general, the pad process allows you to have oriented growth on single crystal substrates, and that's why people uh, like to use this of, for, for very, th very thin films. 
So the MGB2 is done by a reactive coevaporation method uh, where the boron, I believe, is actually an E-beam uh, e system. And the samples are rotated from the, uh, so it's a sequential coevaporation method. Uh, it's, uh, the samples are rotated from the boron deposition zone into the uh, magnesium evaporation zone continuously. Um, and you, you basically react, uh, uh, react these thin layers as you deposit them. Uh, the Kagoshima University deposition method is two E-beam sources, one for the boron and one for the, uh, for the magnesium. So that in, in some ways that can be controlled a little bit more carefully because you, uh, you can easily control the flux of, of each component separately. All right, so let me talk a little bit about niobium substrate conditioning. And so there's been some, there was some discussion this morning about the nature of uh, uh, niobium surface and how that affects uh, the, the magnetic behavior, uh, especially under RF for these things. Uh, so what we've, what we've taken to doing is actually annealing the uh, niobium at 800 degrees C. This is an example in ultra-high vacuum. So the, 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 the pressure in this system is 10 to the minus 9 torr or better. Uh, we initially start with uh, a surface, and this is the XPS. This is a niobium 3D spectra in the XPS. We initially start with uh, a, a surface that is largely... Uh, niobium oxide, NB2O5, and the, the layer is thin enough so that we actually see through it with the XPS in this particular thing, and we see the, the two spin orbit couple peaks uh, associated with the underlying metal, okay? Now, if we anneal that in, uh, if we anneal that up to 800 C, and this was, this particular one was done 800 C for four hours in UHV, um, obviously the NB2O5 disappears. We're dissolving the oxygen into the subsurface, and the, uh, the metallic niobium peaks show up. However, it's not perfect. If you look at the, if you look, there's still some oxygen left, it's, and it, but it's substoichiometric oxygen now. It's not NB205. Um, and that's actually, I have the oxygen spectra as well, but that's actually shown here as, uh, as the tailing, the substoichiometric uh, uh, niobium oxide is shown as the tailing to higher binding energy. Um, so, you might actually consider that uh, as being a defected, uh, as it being a defected oxide. That's a good way to view it, and these might be actually magnetic penning sites that that we should possibly be concerned with. Um, so, so this this particular spectrum again, it's the niobium 3D, and we've done angle resolved spectroscopy to try to understand uh, what the BCP process is doing to the surface of the material. Um, so the sort of the take-home message or the thing to, to remember in this case is that at 90 degree takeoff angle, um, this is the sampling angle for the, for the XPS measurement, we look as deep as possible into the surface and that's sort of on the order of the, uh, of the mean free path for this particular photoelectron or it's, it's on the order of maybe a few mean free paths of this particular photoelectron and it might be something uh, like 50 to uh, 70 angstroms. Uh, in depth, and then at 20 degree takeoff angle, we look at uh, look at much shallower angles. So, so here at 90 degree takeoff angle, uh, we see the the two spin orbit couple peaks from the metal, uh, from the underlying metal, and from the uh, NB205 overlayer. As we roll it over to 20 degree takeoff angle, we can see that the the oxide peaks are enhanced. This is the same sample. The oxide peaks are enhanced and the metal peaks are down. So if you take the ratio of those two, you can actually back out what the film thickness of the NB205 is, and we calculate something that's uh, 27 to 30 angstroms in thickness resulting from the uh, a BCP treatment for this particular material. Um, so let me talk about...